Now, <clears throat> this scene, I just copied over the ground and the camera, made some adjustments to just make it a square camera. That way, you know, we don't have to rebuild everything from scratch. Let's reuse what we have just to save time here. And that's one of the great things about Houdini. It's really easy to just copy paste nodes and materials and stuff down. Um, and yeah, actually, let's come in here. Let's get rid of the diamond shader. We're not going to use that anymore. We're keeping our ground shader. And let's get rid of this deadline node since I don't need it. And let's just make the the uh, the little water cube. So we're going to drop down a file node. Let's move that up here. Jump inside of here. Let's drop down a box. Let's move our camera around. First of all. And actually, no, we do need to look through the camera to see how big of a cube we're going to make. So let's make... I don't know, maybe something three by three by three. And actually no no no. Let's let's back up. Let's do a plane or a grid, I mean. And this will make things a little easier for us. And let's shrink this down to let's do five. And let's drop down a mountain sop. And this will give us our displacement on the surface. And for our grid, let's increase our rows to 200 by 200. So we get some decent quality on top of our grid here. And our focus point is this null here, so that's okay. I might push it back later. And let's mess around with our mountain. So let's make this look like more like pool water. So we've got our, our scale options, our offset, our, our pulse length, the type of um, noise, Perlin flow, periodic flow. I think flow, regular flow, or Perlin will be okay. Let's just stick to Perlin. And let's decrease the roughness so it's a little smoother. So we've got something like that, like a pool surface. And then if we animate the time later, We'll kind of get this movement going on. Right now it's moving too high up, I think. So let's adjust that in our height here. And our element size is the, the size of the waves. So we can make them bigger or smaller. I think we'll go a little smaller, but decrease the height. So it's something like maybe like that. We'll bring in a little bit more of that roughness. And let's just see what we get when we animate this. Okay, cool. So I'm going to just put in dollar frame, I mean, uh dollar sign F and that should animate per frame. That's actually a little too too much. Let's try FF. I think that's animating too fast. So let's uh, divide the speed. Let's just divide by 25. Let's see what we get. And this looks a little more subtle. And so what dollar sign F means, it just means for every frame change the the number. And FF is for every float frame in between frames. And then we just divided that by 25, so the speed is slower. I think this is okay. Cool. 
Now, our next node we're going to drop down is the volume um, extrude or extrude volume. <clears throat> we'll connect this here, and that gives us this thickness, as you guys can see right there. And so I'm going to lift the grid up and let's drop a transform actually let's drop the transform at the end so let's first get our grid at the depth we want so the depth controls the the distance here so you guys can see that it's making it larger or smaller and our grid size was five so let's make this negative five to make it a cube that actually might be a little too deep so let's do four and let's check out the side view using the transform we're gonna just push this up to about where our grid is so that should give us a cool little cube here and we'll shrink it down maybe zero point seven let's bring it down let's rotate it to a little more of an exciting angle something like this maybe and let's move our null location so that the camera moves a little so something like that and we can see that the the liquid is moving and the camera's rotating so let's kill wireframe mode just hit play so we've got a little bit of movement going on up top and maybe I'll animate the cube rotate it around I don't know we'll see and <clears throat> let's actually move our camera so something like that oops and we'll move our null a little bit all right now let's come in here and make another redshift material we'll call this our liquid and swap over the material we'll call this our water we'll connect this to that and let's actually just fire off a test render so let's save and just see what we get and alright we've got some something going on this is a little big so let's shrink this down to 100 just for faster IPR and let's disable the bokeh let's go back to our object 
Let's drop down some normals. And so there we go. We've got our our cube here. And what happened here? Oh, the animation, I think, on the camera. The keyframes. Yeah, we're going to have to get rid of those. So let's come over here. Hit shift click and let's just kill the animation frames actually let's just delete channels we'll get a little bit of movement from the null Okay, cool. Now, let's adjust our light here. So where is our light? Let's, let's reload that. Our light's right over there. So let's look through our light. Maybe something like that. And let's increase the intensity. Let's just see what happens. Whoa, that's way too much. Let's get rid of our bloom glare. Maybe something like that. Let's do ten, five, maybe we'll make it a little bigger. Moved our ground. Let's brighten the ground up a little. And actually, it doesn't look like the ground's. Oh, there we go. Check out our dome light. And let's move on to the material. So, water. Let's get rid of the roughness for now. And our weight and color just need to be black. And water's IOR, I believe, is 1.31. And actually, before we do that, let's activate refraction so you guys could see the difference inside here. So the shape is a little different. And we're going to come in here and do our usual. So get rid of coal, 
dim internal reflections and then shadow opacity we might not use this we'll see and there's thin wall we're not gonna I don't think will will help us for this particular shot so we're gonna keep it that way and we're gonna talk about transmittance here so if this was an ocean or um, something deep a pool you're gonna want the color to get attenuated so this is like if this was like clear perfect water and the reality is that just doesn't happen often you get perfect water like that and actually we should do this with caustic so you can get a better idea so let's come over here and let's decrease our spread Let's try point one. And darken our ground a bit more. Add a little bit of color. Make sure that we have always activated on our light always always and let's move the light around until we get something something nice Switch it to a spotlight. Let's shrink our cone angle a little. And let's just see what we get. So this looks a little better. Um, let me try this without the diffuse and see what we get. So let's keep this on. We'll disable the spotlight and try it again. We're getting a little bit of caustic light, but not a lot. So I think we're gonna we're gonna stick to our spotlight. And let's save our scene. So we've got our hard caustics on the ground here.
see what happens if we focus our angle a little more. And we might move it around to try to get different shapes. Okay, that didn't have the result I wanted. Let's keep it a little bigger. Let's look through our light here. Let's go low. Let's try that again. Some weirdness is going on here. I'm going to drop this down to 400,000 for speed. And I might have to actually remesh this as quads on the sides. That might be causing trouble. So there's a game dev tool, game dev, uh, what was it called, mesh, instant mesh, no, game dev voxel mesh, I think this is what it's called, yeah, and this basically sp imports your mesh and re-VDBs re it in the um, quads and then it spits it back out so let's see I'm gonna save because sometimes this could be really intense and it looks like it did a pretty good job pretty quickly let's see what we get and actually the normal needs to come at the end there we go that fixed our issues so let's drop our normal here the problem was the uh, Extrude volume creates weird stretched polygons. So this, uh, the SOP voxel mesh, generates some nice um, surface topology that looks a little better. Let's try this again. Okay, now we're getting some nicer influence on the inside. One of the downsides to caustics and redshift, since it's not an IPR progressive, you have to keep rendering and re-rendering, and it could it can get tedious at times. So we're actually going to start progressive, but we're going to switch over to bucket mode. So that way we can kind of get a preview here. So this is making some cool little caustics inside. We're going to give the ground a cast also. And let's actually link that up. Whoa. That messed up my viewport. That was pretty weird. I'm not seeing our light in the viewport.
Oh, Ben, it's because I'm locked to it. That's why. <laughs> Oops. There we go. Okay, let's unlock. I'm going to try to copy this to this transform here. Let's save. Let's bring this down. And actually, let's copy parameter paste relative reference copy parameter paste relative reference and we're going to activate this just to see what what we get let's try again let's save Actually, I need to drop our photons. This is a little high. Just for IPR speed. And we're losing that detail on the inside, which I don't like. Yeah, no, so we're going to stick to the the uh, spotlight. And it gives nicer results on the inside here. Let's head over to the attenuation. And so in here, there's several things we could do. But let's say we wanted this to be a little murkier. Switch over to blue, and I thought IPR was on. So you guys can see what's going on here. So the uh, the light as it travels into this refractive object even though the water is clear or the refraction color is white what's being transmitted as the light passes through is this blue color and so if we increase the the value the brightness of that blue color it's going to increase the brightness of the liquid inside you guys see that so the closer to white it gets, the more transparent or the more light travels through. And the closer to black we get, the less light goes through and we're only getting it in like certain edges and, and different areas like that. The thinner areas. Now, that's what the absorption scale controls also. So this controls the color that's being absorbed. And the absorption scale, depending on the scale of your scene, so if we increase this, notice how those edges are now gone because it's absorbing more based on the scale of absorption. So if we were to do 0 0.1, you'll see that it's absorbing less now. And if we do 0, 0, or 0, one you'll notice that it almost looks clear now let's do 0.5 and you guys can see how it's mostly um, absorbed 
at the top, and then as it travels through, the attenuation fades out. So we're going to keep this at 1, though, for now. And the next thing you, you have to keep in mind is the scatter. So right now, by default, this is set at 0 or off. If we turn this on to 1, you'll see what's happening where it's scattering light inside of it. So it kind of almost looks like a volume or like a jello. And what's happening is this white or, pu or all the wavelengths are scattering inside here. So if you don't want a shift of color, you could just keep this white and adjust the scatter scale and that'll control how much it fades into your dark color. So if we switch this to, I don't know, whatever, red or something. It's the same thing. You'll see that it's lighter here on these edges because that's the scattering of white. And then as it gets deeper into the object, it gets darker. So we'll, we're going to move this back to something tropical. So this bluish color. And if you change the color here, let's switch this to red. It's scattering red light in here and attenuating at the same time. So usually I don't mess with the scatter color that much. You want it to remain mostly in the white color. Because the darker you make it, the more influence that red has the deeper into your color. So let's say you wanted it to be, I don't know, like a, a, a brighter green or, or a greenish on the edges. You could do something like a green or we'll do this teal. And you'll notice that it's only on the edges and that's because it's not too bright, not too, too dark. And if we make it darker, it influences more of the, the depth of the cube. while lighter influences just the edges of the scattering and then saturation obviously you know it saturates the color more so we're going to do something like in the middle so maybe something like this And we're going to shift this into the blue a little more. So that it's blue the deeper you go into this little cube. And then the phase controls the direction of the scattering. So if we go negative, the uh, direction of the scattering I believe is towards the camera and positive is away from the camera and so it has less influence keep in mind if you mess with phase it adds render time like a lot <laughs> so if you don't have to use phase that much try to avoid it it's to control the the backscatter or forward scatter the anisotropic values of of the uh, light scattering so we're going to push it back a little bit because I want more of the uh, darkness to come in. And our scatter scale, we could increase it. Let's go a little bit more. No, maybe a little less. 
And for our transmittance, we're going to increase this value. So it's not as dark. I mean, if we went all the way bright, you'd see that it it's really bright in here. So we're going to absorb a little bit more light, but we're going to desaturate it a little more. Maybe go a little darker. And you guys, you guys might be wondering about this uh, red color. This is because whatever's left over after all this absorption is probably in the red hues. If we look at this color here, the opposite is in this reddish pink zone. So that's what's happening. That after it absorbs all that color, what's left over is the opposite, which is this red. So actually, let's uh, decrease this a little. Lower the saturation. kind of like it more in the blues so we'll do this and we'll decrease the scatter scale let's keep the phase at zero Yeah, we'll keep the phase at, well, no, let's see what we get. Okay, this is a little, a little closer to the look I want. And we could change the refraction color also if we wanted to adjust things even further. So this would make it refract a much darker kind of a color. So something like this, where it overpowers our attenuation, but it's not all the way overpowering. You can still see it kind of on the edges here. So maybe shift that over to the greens. And let's attenuate more of the blue. And we'll keep this green for a scattering. So it kind of it gave us that greenish color and then as the light goes into the object the transmittance color starts to attenuate into the bluish the deep blues but we're also getting a little bit of scattering 
on the edges of this greenish teal color. And I mean, we could match it with the uh, color above. Let's see what happens. Yeah, so now we've got our surface kind of attenuating a little bit of light. We've got some caustics inside of our cube. I don't think they're coming out of the cube, which is a little weird. And that's probably just due to the light position. So I'd have to move things around until, until I like how it looks. Maybe we could change the HDR to something else also. So let's swap that over to the substance HDRs and I don't know, let's see what we get. So this is kind of cool. A little too dark. Okay, this one's kind of nice. I like this HDR, so we're going to stick to this one. Let's turn back on some of our post effects here. Let's change our f stop to 8. Saturation's a little too high, so let's do 1. Yeah, we'll keep that at 1. Point 0.2. We'll change the white point. Cool. We've got this little cube here. So the light's coming in. It's getting absorbed as it gets deeper into the cube. And then we've got some caustics going on. And you can see how it's fading the gradient. And so this is how you would make water that gets deeper. The effect of, you know, an ocean or, or dirty water. You would just use different colors. So you would get, you have to play with the uh, attenuation. So the transmittance color, and then some of the scattering. So if I turn off the scattering, let's just let's make this zero. You'll see how much how much of an effect that scattered light has inside of here. So basically, at the, right now it's just going in and kind of just that's it. It's getting absorbed really quickly. And so 0 0.3, notice how big of a difference that made in just giving us a nice little scattered light going inside of our dark cube that's getting absorbed. And if we disable absorption, so you guys can see what that looks like also, you'll notice that now <laughs> the light is just going right through. And so we're getting scattering still. We're getting that green scatter. So if we disable both, 
you'll see that now it's the color is only being affected by the color up here but the light is shining right through so if it was if you wanted this to look deep or have absorption of light you want to increase your absorption so you want absorption but if you want it to look like there's a little bit of light kind of passing through you need also scattering so it's a two a two effect thing to get that look so let's save here and I think we could you know move around the light play with it a little is this our spotlight yeah just increase the brightness see what happens whoa it's way too much <laughs> let's try seven still too much so you also you have to keep in mind how the caustic influence happens in here and actually let's go to our out and disable how does our caustics look you can barely see them disable oh it is disabled let's turn it on and see what we get no it doesn't really look like anything's going on so we'll keep that disabled Let's go to our liquid material. And let's see what happens if we add shadow. Just a yeah, so it darkened it way too much. But maybe something like this, a little lower, is a little acceptable. Let's try point two. And let's rotate our object around just to, for fun, just to see what we get. Oh, something weird is going on right there. But overall, it looks, you know, it looks cool. It looks like a deep liquid even though it's just a tiny little little box here. And I think we can make further adjustments to the light, move the light around, try to get some of the, the caustic light to come out. And also we can mess with the, uh, the lumps of the mesh. So if we come in here and drop this down. just see what we get you can see that that had an influence on the shapes inside of here
And you can see that the, the reflections and stuff are changing. Pretty cool. So I think a nice little animation of this with our frames changing. And so the surface moving around. Maybe divide by 10. Might give us some interesting little animation. And actually, I don't think the animation is updating without hitting reload. So I'm going to keep it at 25. Cool. So I'm probably going to make some more little adjustments here and there. Maybe we'll throw in some bubbles inside of the box. And just so I can discuss nested dielectrics real quick with you guys. So I'll be right back. Hey guys, so I'm back. I spent a little while adjusting our light position to get some nicer caustics on the ground in the shadow. And I also tweaked the surface detail a little bit. And I decided to add a little bit of a box so it looks kind of like a fish tank is holding the water in. And this is just because why not, you know, just for complexity in the refractions to make things a little more interesting. And also discuss nested dielectrics a little bit. So in order for the refraction to look correct, you need to actually have intersections on objects. So if you were to imagine that this liquid here was a bottle and this is like the the soda or whatever the water inside your bottle and this box on the outside is your your glass your your bottle the actual material of the bottle in order for it to work correctly it needs to actually intersect and so if I hit the W key and let's look at the top view here where is it oops and we zoom in here a little bit you'll notice that it's intersecting so you can see that the fluid which is this geometry and this geometry which is the the box they're meeting and so they're overlapping you need to have this overlap if you don't have this overlap what happens is that the refraction inside the object comes out wrong so that's something to keep in mind um, as part of nested dielectrics, you need to have overlap, overlap. So your glass and your liquid have to intersect just a little bit. Because if they don't, if they're perfectly um, positioned, you get actually error. So let me uh, come back here. And I'll, and I'll also explain like how to get a bubble or an object inside also. So I added a sphere. It's in the center here. And... I made a render and so this is our our render currently and so you can see that we've got this glass kind of container and we've got our sphere in here with uh, caustics on it and then we've got some caustics down here at the bottom right now if this container wasn't intersecting if it was just perfectly lined up without an intersection it actually causes errors. So if I jump into the glass box here and I believe the transform is what's doing that. So let me check. Yeah, I think it's the transform. So you see how I transformed it in? If I were to, let's just make a, a second transform here and we'll just duplicate the normal. And instead of shrinking it in, I made it just, let's just see what one gives us. And instead of one, let's do something like this. And we don't have that intersect. Oops. That intersection. 
that's going to cause problems. Same thing if we don't have normals. You want the normals to face the, the correct direction. So if we render this again, let's come over here. And I should save this. What's likely to happen is we're going to get some some strangeness. And actually, no, this worked out okay. But we are getting some a little bit of weird stuff going on down here and on certain edges. And the problem is that the ne the due to nested dielectrics, you need intersection. So this is something that a lot of people don't realize when they're working with uh, bottles of of liquids, and their liquid is either too small, and it's or it's right on the edge perfectly. And so what happens is the refraction inside doesn't calculate correctly. So something to keep in mind when you guys do that when you have nested dielectrics where you have refraction of a different IOR and refraction of another IOR you need to have intersection otherwise redshift won't automatically detect that it's a nested dielectric so let's delete that let's turn that back on and come down here now another way I could I could show you this is using our little sphere so if I press play here We've got our solid sphere inside. Right now, I'm, I'm just using IPR, so you can't see the caustics on the sphere. But if I just slide it up, you can see also the transmission. So the sphere is white. And as we put it into the liquid, you'll notice that it starts to get darker and darker the deeper in it goes. Actually, let's just select this. And so as I start putting it in, the transmission starts to darken our sphere. Even though the sphere is a is a, a pretty much almost white, that's what happens. And that's that's due to the effect of transmission that we were talking about earlier. So the light gets attenuated, and even though this is a really bright white sphere, it's getting absorbed. And so for our example, I'm going to actually use a different material. I made a separate, um, this is deep blue water, and then I have just regular water. And the only difference is that the, I'm going to give you guys both so you guys can see the difference. This one has different um, colors, so that's why we're getting the, the greenish and then the blue shifting. And if you want the colors to match perfectly, no matter, you just want the, the attenuation and the scattering, but you don't want the color hue shift, just use the same colors in both. So if I switch that over, let's go to our, our uh, liquid here and select our water. This is a version where the liquid isn't shifting in hue and it's just the same color. So if we come in here, I'm using a really light color here. And like I mentioned, you don't want to use saturated colors. You can. I mean, you know, we're, we're, this is 3D rendering. But technically, um, what you want to do is you want to use the same, like, very desaturated colors to be more physically accurate. You want to use um, very desaturated colors and very light colors. Now... Normally, another thing that you're technically supposed to do is you're supposed to also have a scatter scale of 1 and an absorption scale of 1. And this is considered more accurate because the absorption and scatter are matching. But for artistic purposes, I personally would rather adjust it this way. And... If you just want that same color scattering through, obviously keep these two colors the same. Because the moment I change this color to, I don't know, something else, you'll see how it starts to shift the colors inside. And so a lot of people, when they first start using this, 
they they kind of don't get what's going on they're like why is this color changing all weird i just want it to be the same well that's that's how you keep things the same just so you guys remember so just use the same color oops oh well yeah i guess yeah right there using the same colors will keep things consistent but let's go back i want this to be bluish and if you just want it to be darker you could just increase or decrease the absorption so increasing the absorption you can see that now our little sphere inside is barely visible while if i do something like 0 0.1 it's almost clear you could see our sphere inside okay cool we'll keep this at one now Another thing that I forgot to mention earlier when we were talking about glass and stuff is the link to reflection. Technically, this disables your roughness and IOR so that they use the same. But, this is, again, this is a physically accurate thing. You, you should, whatever your roughness and IOR appear, have to be the same in here to be physically accurate. But sometimes, for artist purposes, you want to have roughness inside and keep the specular shiny on top. So just disable that and add a little bit of roughness. And that's up to you as, a, as an artist approach to just add a little imperfection. Um, so anyways, let's check out our sphere. So to make this a bubble, you actually have to set things up the correct way. And so <clears throat> this is our, our, let's just call this bubble. our bubble shader and in order for this to work we need it to be refractive obviously so we're going to activate refraction and you're going to notice some weirdness going on so it looks kind of strange like it looks like a bubble but something seems off about it and there's several reasons why that's the case and one is due to the IOR so air or a vacuum has an IOR of one and now it looks a little more accurate Let's see so that's something to remember if you're gonna put bubbles inside of a liquid of air you need to make sure that you're using an IOR of one air is technically 1.0002 or something like that so if you're using a different gas then there is a different IOR value, but vacuum air is one. It's just easy to remember. Um, something that a lot of people don't realize is if you use the same exact IOR value as your liquid, so let's say water is 1.33, you'll notice that our sphere is gone. Basically, it disappeared. And this actually does happen in real life. So you could YouTube what happens when you have two uh, a gas and a liquid with the same IOR value the gas basically is invisible you can't see it so since we want this to be a bubble we're gonna set an IOR value of one for a vacuum of air cool so now you can see our little bubble inside of here and you have to make sure that the normals are facing inward rather than outward now in this particular scene it doesn't it's not really noticeable but let's say uh, let's reverse or actually let's keep it like this and then I'll show you because you, with a IOR value of one you, it's not that noticeable but let's uh, switch over here and let's do an IOR of 1.5 and let's go to our object and so right now we have just regular normals and let's do a bucket render so you can see this a little cleaner. And let's save. So we'll give this a second to render out with our caustics and stuff. And so you can see that this looks a little strange. And I'll shape I'll save a a snapshot here. So let's save a snapshot and then now let's reverse our normals 
so they're pointing inward. And oddly enough, it seems to be okay. And I think that's just due to the tessellation. So if I come over here, let's just disable tessellation. It'd be probably easier to see. Come in here. Okay, now you can see it. So you can see the polygons are pretty obvious here. And let's just snapshot this and then I'm going to disable reverse normals again. And now it looks like this. So something to keep in mind that your normal direction does matter. So keep that you know, in mind when you put objects into fluids, that the, the direction of your normals are important. All right, so moving on, let's go back to our material. And since we want this to be air, we're gonna make this a value of one. Let's make sure it looks okay. Give this a second to load. and it does seem to look okay okay cool so let's scatter some bubbles inside of our object so to do that we're gonna just quickly use a little trick so we've got our glass object here and we're gonna jump into this and if you come up to the top I believe somewhere what's going on here transform right here this is just a box so it's got a top and a bottom and so we're gonna have the bubbles only show up at this point inside of our box so what I'm gonna do is drop drop down a null and we're gonna plug this in over here we'll keep this here because we want the glass to look that way and we're going to just call this bubbles out. And inside of our sphere object here, and actually, let me make sure that our caustics are enabled, and they weren't. So we want our little bubbles to emit caustics also. So let's check that on. And let me check my, my box also, come to think of it. Um, yep, okay, that's activated. We're going to come in here and we're going to drop down an object merge and we're going to merge in our box. So here's our bubbles out. And the location's different, and the reason is because let's highlight that we have transforms at the top level on our liquid right here that's pushing it up in Y so we're gonna copy this and I already did it for the glass so that way when I animate the liquid everything else is gonna follow it so we're gonna come over here also we're gonna paste relative reference and you can see how it moved down we're gonna copy this also and paste relative reference so that way when I animate this if I rotate it around, it all moves together. Since we're going to make a little animation later. And now that that's in there, let's jump in here. So we have this box now. And what we need to do is convert, we need to scatter points, but not on top of the box, but inside the box. So in order to do that, we need to use a node called ISO offset. And what this does is it converts our geometry into uh, a volume, basically, a volume field. And let's highlight it. And so you can see 
that now it's like a, a volume fog. And so we need to shrink it down a little. Maybe something like that. And we're going to drop a scatter node. And this is going to scatter some points inside of there, as you guys can see. And so some of them are still outside of our our volume. So let's shrink this down. And you could use bounds to to clip the location, the minimum bounds, the maximum bounds, padding bounds. I'm going to just mess with this. This is fine. Using the uh, or the uh, offset. So let's shrink this down a little more. Let's see if we can get our points only on the inside. That's a little too much. I think that's okay right there. Let's look at it from above. Yeah, it seems fine. Okay, cool. And we can adjust this later. So now we've got some points scattered inside of there. I think that's too many points. Let's just do like, I don't know, 400. We can change it later. We'll do 100. And we're going to drop a copy to points and so this is the point side so we're gonna move that over here and we're gonna move our sphere this way we're gonna connect that there and that's gonna copy our sphere right now it's obviously too big so let's shrink this down a little And we're going to do a random attribute. Plug that in over here to our points. And we're going to switch this to P scale. And that way we get variation in the, uh, the size of our points. So we want a, a minimum size. Let's do something like that. point three actually there we go not the capital so now you can see that we've got different size points in here let's maybe increase this a little bit and cool we've got a couple points inside of there now and if we want more points we could adjust things further we need to actually pack this so pack an instance. We're going to make these instances. And for our scatter, let's scatter 500. That's probably way too many actually now, <laughs> now that I look at it. And some of them are getting out of our intersection point. So let's do 300. And let's shrink our size just a little bit okay cool now <clears throat> it doesn't look like any of them are poking out and now we, what we gotta do to make sure that Redshift can read those as instances so we need to go to the Redshift tab come up here to instances where is it Redshift settings instancing and make sure we have instance sop level packed primitives check that on let's save our scene and we should now have point actually let's uncheck that let's render we should have little points inside and since it's using that material the bubble material, they'll be like air bubbles. And there we go.
pretty neat. Now, of course, we could animate this and, and have motion blur, deformation blur, stuff like that. And you can see now we've got our liquid. We've got bubbles inside of it. We've got this glass piece on the outside. Got some dispersion. Some caustics going on all over. And we've got nice caustics going on down here. And I think just for fun, I'm going to put a sphere object inside of there. Just to, why not, you know? So let's drop another sphere down. Let's make sure this is a poly mesh. Let's drop normals on it. And we'll just do 25, 25 on the rows. And let's move this inside. And for the material, we'll just use that white material I had earlier. And actually, let's drop down our redshift material there. And move that over here. Select this. Let's make our color almost white. Something like 91. Let's hit play. And let's disable bucket mode because I kind of want to just move the sphere into position. Let's move it a little bit lower. So that's kind of cool. We've got some interesting refractions and shapes going on. Neat. And so now if we animate our liquid rotating, we'll get some, some interesting results here. And let's just see what we get for our final render here. And let's delete these let's hit render and then I'll try the deep liquid the deep blue liquid just so we can compare them so I'm gonna pause right now so you guys don't have to wait alright guys so here's the two renders so this one's got the uh, green edge scattering into blue and this one's just the blue and you can see some really cool caustic effects going on here and you know it only took 38 seconds to render it is small so it's gonna take quite a while when it gets bigger but I think you know for for what it is it's it's pretty nice quality um, <clears throat> to get all these nice really expensive effects refractions and caustics and stuff so I'm gonna add deformation blur and the motion blur for the object rotating and also the movement of the uh, surface here and maybe I'll add some bokeh just to go real crazy, right? Why not? And we'll see what this result looks like. I'm going to also cache out the uh, geometry for the liquid. So right now on the SOP voxel mesh, we're just using mid quality, which is nice, but high quality gives nicer details on the surface. So I'm going to test that out first to see if, if it changes how the caustics look by a lot. And if not, then I'll just stick to mid and I'll be right back. Alright guys, so I, I'm back. I cleaned up the uh, elements, organized them a little bit better, added a rig for the rotation for all the objects to follow, and I did a quick little flip book.
just to see kind of what's going on. So you can see how the, uh, the surface is moving around and the cube's gonna be rotating. And I just did some quick tests to see how everything looks. So we've got motion blur activated now. And so there's, it's subtle, but it's there. And just checking a different angle. And you can see the caustics moving around, the light, the bloom. So this is gonna be a cool little, little animation of a rotating cube and the surface moving. The uh, surface might be moving too fast, actually. So I might have to recache the surface to be a little slower. Uh, but maybe I'll keep it. Maybe it'll make the, the caustics dance on the ground a lot better. And if we come in here to the liquid, you can see that all I did was I added a trail sop. And you need to do this if you're going to be using deformation blur where the... Uh, point counts change and you just switch it to compute velocity and you adjust the velocity scale until you like what it looks like and then I just added normals and a ROP geometry out and I cached out the uh, movement so it's faster in viewport we don't have to deal with you know as much of uh, the, co the computing of the SOPs all the way going up all the way up here so that cached out to disk and it made a a couple frames here, about 300 megs, pretty small. We could go higher resolution on the mesh, but honestly, it's going to be moving around, so why bother? And I just loaded everything back in with the file node, loading in that cache we wrote out. Um, but yeah, I think I think this is cool. We might, like I said, uh, adjust the speed if we need to on the mountain time maybe divide it by 30 or 40. Our out node, I just increased our render samples and added the uh, mesh deformation blur. And so what the uh, trail sop does, if we come back up here to our object. If we come over here and middle mouse click this, you'll notice that we have the V value for velocity. And so it computes our velocity for us. So all you have to do is go under redshift in the settings, activate deformation instant particle blur from velocity attribute. So with that activated, it's detecting our velocity now. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I think this is this is pretty much you know cool looking. I think this is good to go to send off to deadline and render a little animated short of this rotating around. So I'm gonna let that render and. That might take a couple hours, so I'm going to just pause the video, and I'll be back, and then we'll go over the results. So, be right back. Hey guys, so this is the uh, finished result on our animation. So I loaded it up into mPlay, and we're just going to play the shot. And so, <clears throat> it's not a perfect loop, so it's kind of getting some jumping going on. But you guys can see all the caustics moving around based on the surface movement. And the surface is probably moving a little too fast, but that's fine. And we're getting the whole thing rotating. We're getting some nice caustics on top of the uh, sphere moving around. And all the neat little refraction and all that stuff going on across the surfaces. So, yeah, pretty cool. Um, took a couple hours to render this. Not too bad. And, yeah, I think that, you know, hopefully after this tutorial series you guys kinda have an idea of all the options that are available for refraction and how to get different layering of refraction and caustics the IOR how it all kinda plays a role together and some of the more obscure options like cold dim internal um, reflections and shadows also the uh, light refraction activation and also the optimization for um, ray cutoffs, which is you know a neat little kind of a performance, an extra little level of performance if you guys want to cut down your renders a bit. And so as you guys can see, this scene really was all about refraction and reflection. So I left that high in the settings and everything else kind of can just go away <laughs> since it's not as important. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, so I'm gonna include 
both of the uh, diamond scene and this scene, everything's included, so you guys can come in here and investigate everything and check out the animation and whatever you guys want to look at. You know, it's all it's all there, and you guys will be able to check out the materials that are all included, and and you guys get the HDRs too. So, anyways, um, but yeah, thanks again everybody for your support on patreon and youtube really appreciate it um if you guys have any other kind of particular requests feel free to ask um several people have been asking about caustics and refraction and so that's why you know this tutorial got made <laughs> so if there's other things that have been requested feel free to you know drop me a message and or post it on my patreon page and you know if if there's enough demand for it well i'll go over some of the the details and information in here. Um, I'm hoping that relatively soon we'll finally start getting OSL and Redshift 3 and that's going to be a whole other subject matter unto itself that we could touch on that's really important for the future. Um, but yeah, so thanks again guys and enjoy.